I'm an artist. I tell stories with pictures. So I'd like you to join me in conjuring a picture. It's October and it's late afternoon. I'm in my studio on the edge of the bush in the lower Blue Mountains. The air is whirring and buzzing with the sounds of insects and birds. And I'm standing at my easel with four brushes and a rag in my left hand and another smaller flat edge brush in my right. My little dog is asleep on the floor in the sun. Yet I am oblivious to all this. My attention is focused intently on the mark that I am making right now on the canvas. Every action I take changes the complex web of relationships in the picture. This blue-green vibrates more against that burnt umber than the yellow-green. Adding titanium white to the cloud changes the perception of depth in the sky. The direction of this line leads my eye to the corner of the picture, and so on and so on. Each time I make a mark, I reshape my brush on the rag, and then I reach to reload with precisely the right amount of paint in the exact color that I need. And then I make another stroke with the brush, or perhaps two. The marks that I'm making go on with ease and confidence. I feel relaxed and comfortable. My thinking is fluid and focused, shifting seamlessly between noticing and analyzing what is happening and responding intuitively. I feel deep pleasure and joy. My body feels light and energized. Painting feels effortless, like I can do no wrong. Time seems to stretch and also disappear. I want to be in this moment forever. That is a picture of creative flow, where I feel and perform at my best. Would you also like to experience that? And preferably, you can see some people nodding, whenever you want. We've been led to believe that artistic expression and creative flow are the domain of the gifted few. That there's some magical, hidden talent that only some people possess. Even those in this exclusive club need to access inspiration, another elusive ingredient shrouded in mystery. For those of us brave enough to go looking for advice on the matter, most of it amounts to hot tips, quick fixes, and hacks that simply miss the point. They leave us feeling dissatisfied and duped, languishing in inactivity and frustration. The problem most of us have is that we do not have a clue how to begin, and we have even less idea how to sustain creativity over time. I thought that I knew. After all, I've been an artist for over 30 years. Being creative is my world, the place that I've called home. But then in 2020, I had a massive personal crisis. This completely turned my life and my work upside down. Within the space of just a few months, I went from being confident, optimistic, and competent to doubting everything I thought I knew. It was as though all of the events, memories, and beliefs that gave meaning to and made sense of my life had been scrambled and now lay trampled on the ground. I was adrift in uncertainty, bereft in pain and confusion. Before this, my work had largely been dramatic, gestural and ethereal landscapes. So before this, my work had largely been dramatic, gestural or ethereal landscapes. 
filled with evocative images of mountains, skies, and water. I've always worked with landscape, but the real subject matter of my work is not nature's phenomena, people, or places. Rather, my paintings speak about human experiences of joy, hope, loss, and longing and in particular of my spiritual encounters in nature. In the few years leading up to this crisis, I had been preoccupied with a beautiful little place near my home, Glenbrook Lagoon. My work had been exploring my deep connection with this place and the sense in which I experienced it as sacred. As 2020 unfolded, my work began to change reflecting the challenges in my life and my state of mind. My paintings began imaging reflected worlds that could almost be flipped over, paralleling my search for truth and grappling for reality. Dark trees began framing and partially obscuring the landscape beyond, acting both visually and metaphorically as a barrier or a line of containment. As I sank deeper into distress and survival mode, as if my vision narrowed, my paintings filled with detail. At the time, I felt confused by the shift in my style, and yet I felt compelled to work in that way. Then, for a short time, oh, sorry, I've gone. No, that's right. <laughs> then, for a short time, I stopped creating altogether, and I only made paintings. What I mean is that I painted without really taking any risks or exploring anything new. Without any joy, ability to be vulnerable or confident, I was only able to go through the motions and wasn't truly able to innovate or step into my creative flow. This didn't last long. The fear, despair, and shame of living outside my authenticity meant that I stopped painting completely for many, many months. When I finally began to recover, my work was different. I began a series of tiny 20 by 20 centimeter sky paintings painted a la prima. This means painted all at once or all in one sitting. And the reason I did this is that I wanted the mark making to be filled with spontaneity and vitality. I wanted the images to be filled with life and energy and for the immediacy of the process itself to draw me into creative flow. Alongside these, I made a series of 30 by 30 centimeter images of densely wooded bushland. These were incredibly detailed paintings that took many, many days to make with tiny brushes. I would stand up close and become completely absorbed in the fine mark making. I became fascinated with how up close the marks appeared abstract and unself conscious, and yet, as if by magic, when I stood away, they seemed to coalesce to create a coherent image. These works, both the skies and the tree paintings, seemed to draw me and others in. They invited intimacy, and at the same time, they acted as portals to the world beyond. In the past, when I'd experienced struggles in my life and my work, I'd always pushed or driven myself hard to get through. Thanks to my mum, I know the power of a good list, and I would make lists and resolutions, and I'd follow them. Thanks to my dad, I had the sense that I could achieve anything or fix anything if I was just prepared to put in the effort. On this occasion, however, 
neither of these normally useful strategies were enough. Fortunately, thanks to my grandmother, I had another way of coping. As a child, I would often walk with her on the cliffs of a fishing village in the Western Cape of South Africa. She taught me to stop and to breathe, to slow down and to notice what was around me. The rocks, the lichen, the smell of the fane bush, the colours in the clouds, the creatures in the water or wriggling on the track. Decades before the popularisation of mindfulness, my grand showed me how to be present and bathe in nature. So, when I found myself unable to paint or even to be in my studio, I sought solace in nature and spent hours wandering or just sitting in the bush near my home. The solitude, and yet the sense of being companioned, brought me deep consolation. As I walked each day, I experienced struggle and wonder. I witnessed beauty, decay, and renewal. And gradually, I began to reconnect with my joy and my desire to paint. It was as though the words of my favourite poet Mary Oliver once more came alive in me. To pay attention, be astonished and tell about it. I stopped pushing and striving and I softened back into a space of self-compassion and trust. I gave myself permission to slow down and to breathe. Again, paraphrasing Mary Oliver, I allowed the soft animal of my body to love what it loves. Instead of rising before dawn each day, regardless of my sleep, to keep a grueling exercise regime, I began easing into my day. My goal-focused activity gave way to mindful and unconscious movement, to contemplative walking, yoga, swimming and dancing. When I exercised, I invited curiosity and playfulness and was attentive to my surroundings and my own needs, thoughts and emotions. I embraced music and journaling I made a huge effort to get more sleep, to rest when I needed to, to eat well, and most importantly, to only share my life with people that I could trust. As I began working in my studio again, I deliberately created a safe and sacred space for myself. I eliminated distractions in particular the intrusions of my phone and my computer. I protected my infant ideas, allowing them time to percolate and develop. I guarded myself against the potential harms of social media, where anybody, regardless of their experience or perspective, can comment and criticize. I consciously sought to stay in my own lane, knowing that to compare myself with others I risked my autonomy and authenticity. When the shame gremlins turned up, voicing old stories about measures of success or work ethic, I noticed, but I chose instead to trust myself. Whenever I felt the urge to strive or pressure to succeed, I intentionally softened back, reconnecting in nature. My life began to feel steady and spacious. It was as though as I grounded into the earth, connected with my spirituality and the fullness of my humanity, I was able to reconnect with my creative flow. Each of the practices I did relied on connection, curiosity and courage, 
And importantly, they required my commitment and my conviction, my why. Without a strong sense of purpose, the belief that what we're doing is worthwhile and contributes something meaningful to the world, most of us cannot sustain creative practice. An essential part of my recovery to flow was to re-inhabit my values and in particular my purpose for painting. As I recommitted to my intentions to create beauty, to speak into the hearts of my audience about our shared humanity and to evoke wonder in nature, my joy and my hope were rekindled. I was able once more each day to be present in connection, to be courageous to take risks and be vulnerable, and to be curious and receptive to the world around me. I was able once more to embrace my longing so beautifully expressed in these words of Mary Oliver's. When it's over, I want to say, all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. Thank you.